Okay, everyone, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, cool. So hello, everyone. Welcome to Introduction to Monitoring and Evaluation. Um, my name is Jim, and I'll be your instructor for this lesson. Um, I am in partnership with Statistics Without Borders and African Institute for Professional Development. And today I am going to talk about what it means to perform monitoring and evaluation, as well as in a research or a statistical context, what do these two terms mean? So a little bit about me. I am a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley, and I majored in economics and operations research and management science. So I have a pretty um, heavy statistical as well as mathematic background with dabs of policy as well as government um, science in there. I was a consultant at PwC, which is a con uh, an accounting firm, and I'm currently working at Meta as a product specialist for the Facebook app. So for this class, um, we aim to introduce you to project monitoring and evaluation activities. And we'll get into the definition of what these two words mean um, in just a bit. We're also going to introduce you to why monitoring and evaluation are crucial to the success of any project. And this is not only limited to research projects, this is also limited to um, any scoping activities that you can do with um, any endeavors that you take. Lastly, we're going to introduce you to key activities in monitoring and evaluation. So what are some of the key milestones as well as goals that you want to achieve and get out of monitoring and evaluation activities? <clears throat> so by the end of this class, um, I hope that all of you will be able to discuss and plan monitoring and evaluation activities comfortably, as well as implement specific achievements in monitoring and evaluation pertaining to a specific project or whatever project you're working on, and as well as communicate the importance of monitoring and evaluation activities to stakeholders. Again, as a member of the project, you have your own ownership areas. And if your ownership area is monitoring and evaluation, then this is a crucial area that you want to convey to um, the other partners in your project that you're working with. And this is why this activity even though it's usually performed at the beginning of the project, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, it's still very important to the success of the project as a whole. So for today, um, this lesson will start off with what it means to plan in M&E um, activities. I'm just going to show us that way. As well, I'm going to define what do the words monitoring and evaluation mean, both separately, together, and in context with a project that you're doing. We're also gonna talk about what could possibly go on, go wrong um, in the process of planning m and &E activities as well as the process of performing these activities. How can you mitigate those uh, risks as well as errors that can potentially arise? As well as some good practices for you um, from my experience as well as from some existing research on what you can do to make your project successful and make your M&E activity successful for the project. Cool. So let's provide a couple definitions right now. So what do we refer to when we talk about monitoring and evaluation? Um, it is important to note that while these terms are coupled together for the sake of this lesson, as well as if you take any project management, um, classes or any project management ownerships, you will see these two terms uh, often together. Um, however, I just want to point that out that there are distinctive functions that are both equally crucial to the success of a project. So we define monitoring as the process that provides information about the project, such as timeline, milestones, objectives, resources, etc., and ensures the use of provided information by management or by your partners to assess project efforts and impact. So you can think of monitoring as the step in which you are collecting data, um, you're collecting information from your partners, as well as collecting any um, information that you can, such as environmental information, any 
key issues or key existing risks that you want to keep in mind, as well as past work that might contribute to the success of the project. So you can think of monitoring for now as gathering information to prepare for key steps along the project. Evaluation is the process that draws on the data and information generated during monitoring and analyzes the trends in respect of the effects and impacts or lack thereof in the project. So evaluation, um, you can think of it as the next step of monitoring. Once you've gathered your data points and once you've gathered your scenarios and information, what are you going to do with the things that you've gathered? You evaluate them. And evaluation is the process in which you analyze your available information in order to make an educated guess or make some sort of correlation um, of whether the project will achieve the goals that you're hoping to achieve, as well as the impact and effects of the project down the line. So as you can see that both functions, monitoring and evaluation, are forward thinking. They provide a forward thinking perspective on the reality of a project, even though they might be retrospective in nature. Now, what does this mean? So both monetary and evaluation look at key data points to determine whether milestones are met. So along the way of the project, um, you might apply monetary evaluation to um, look at certain key metrics along your project to determine whether your goals are fully met. So in nature, it's a little bit retrospective, but the results that you're trying to achieve are quote unquote future look forward looking because you are determining whether the success of the project can be met um, based on these data points. Secondly, um, you're also able to analyze resource efficiency in relation to targets. So this can be done towards the beginning or during the project as a whole. Um, in the beginning where most monetary and value activities or the bulk of it is performed, um, you can look at the available information or any past references um, related to your project and really seeing if those materials can help you drive efficiency or cut down any unnecessary process in order to reach targets within the project. Similarly, during the project, you can um, leverage monitoring and evaluation techniques to make sure that you are gathering existing materials or if new data data sources or new materials that come up in the course of the project um, can be further leveraged, this is the opportunity to do it. You can also able to uh, use the information gathered and analyzed to determine whether the hypotheses, assumptions, as well as inputs to the project are valid before it is too late to make changes. This is hopefully you're able to make a decision with along with your uh, par project partners um, as well as any stakeholders that are, you know, that have a stake in the project. Um, but this is really useful, especially when you're looking at your current progress or the current environment, uh, elements that you can't control. Uh, all of those things determine whether a project will be ultimately su successful or impactful. And monitoring valuation techniques are definitely very useful for that. And lastly, um, it is useful to determine lessons learned to mitigate errors. So after the completion of the project, you can utilize monitoring evaluation techniques, such as looking at past data points, looking at resources that were gathered to really determine what were some of the things that did well, what are some of the things that did not go well, and through you know through our documentation or through storytelling, you're able to convey that, convey those insights to the next project team when they're taking over your work or they're trying to build from your work. So this is really important in not just collaborating within your team, but also collaborating outside of your team. So in short, project monetary and evaluation is critical for the success of a project in meeting its goals, the alignment of expectations between the project and project stakeholder and project task leaders, as well as the continuous improvement of processes, documentation, data gathering, and milestone forecasts throughout the projects and beyond into future projects. 
Now let's talk a little bit about how to plan for m and &E activities. So m and &E, right, it sounds inherently like planning. Um, a lot of definitions I just spoke of um, makes it sound like that monitoring evaluation is a process of planning for the project as a whole. While that is not inaccurate, um, it is important to know that in order to create a successful project plan, in order to create a success, successful exposition and ongoing um, mitigation activities throughout the project, your M&E activities themselves need ample planning. So a monitoring and evaluation plan is used to track and assess the impact of activities throughout the projects, and it is the living document that should be referred to and updated on a regular basis. By what I mean by saying that it's a living document is that while there are many things that might come up during the project that may affect timeline or the milestones or a goal or any activities, the monitoring and evaluation plan should also be living because new stakeholders might onboard or existing stakeholders might uh, leave the project. And there are there might be shifting priorities as well as uh, shifting data points and resources that you can leverage for the project. It is important to develop this plan before beginning any um, activities so that there is a clear plan for what questions that need to be answered and what goals that need to be met. So even before jumping into the, pro uh, the project planning process, if you fail to plan for monitoring evaluation activities, you have a trouble, you will face higher difficulty in determining why your project is important and you have a harder time communicating that to stakeholders. In addition, um, by planning for um, monitoring evaluation, you're able to gather a lot of resources up front, even before you jump into the main activities for project so that you're able to be prepared in turn the project, as well as you can clearly track and document what are some of the data points and resources that you are missing, what are some that you're leveraging, and how are you able to use these information to determine whether uh, the project timeline, the project plan, is realistic or not. And that's very important when you, especially pertaining to bigger projects. Cool. So there are seven general steps to creating an effective m and &E plan. The first one is to identify project goals and objectives. So this step, you're trying to determine what you're, you want to get out of a project at the very end. And it doesn't have to be something concrete. It can be some sort of impact that you're trying to make. Right. So, for example, if I am, let's say, if I'm trying to analyze the trend of um, the U.S. GDP as a result of um, global trade, that sounds very general, right? So, what does it mean to define project goals? Well, I can say that I want to do this project because I want to write a proposal to my local government. Uh, I'm, I'm just throwing examples, don't take it seriously. Um, I want to show, I want to put a report for the local government so that the local government can act on um, monetary measures to help the local, e the local economy. That would be a goal. And that would be an objective that you want to clearly state and achieve. Two is define your key performance indicators and milestones. So I've come across many project plans in the past, including ones I've made myself, that just stated the end goal, right? That I just say, I want to, I want the local government to uh, implement my recommendations for the local economy. That's all I wrote, right? But in the middle, there's so many things that come into that project. For example, um, there's need to be, I need to say something like um, interview researchers, finish all interviews, um, perform statistical analysis on R, um, analysis completed. So these are milestones that you can use to keep track for yourself as well as for your project partners. When the project gets, especially when the project gets big and the end seems so far away, not only can these can stay, help you stay on track and help you stay realistic in your progress, they can also make you feel better. Like honestly, 
um, if the project is very long, these can definitely make sure that you gain a sense of achievement every time you complete or reach a milestone. Number three is to define data collection and recording methodology and timeline. Documentation is crucial to any project that you're doing. And it is important from the very beginning to communicate, to define, formalize, and communicate your methodology of documentation and data collection to the team so that everyone can have a unified process. So not everyone's doing their own thing and the project plan will not become chaotic. Number four is to identify monitoring and evaluation roles and responsibilities. There are many folks within the projects and folks can definitely take on many hats. Um, within monitoring and evaluation, you have to make sure that there is someone who can manage the timeline, make sure everyone is on track, like any other projects, part of the project. Um, someone might be very good at um, data collection or finding data, three, or someone might be very good at you know reviewing literature or uh, determining the environment that this project takes in. All of these roles are very important, and it's very important for you to identify those roles and responsibilities individuals beforehand. Number five is to create an analysis plan and reporting templates while establishing a cadence for feedback discussion. So ultimately you want to receive feedback on your activities and your planning. So when you are moving from monitoring to evaluation, you want to create like a plan so that you can keep track of your activities as well as make your analysis clear, um, especially when you're delivering to the stakeholders who are very much have a lot of stake in the project. You want to make sure that they feel comfortable having you proceed for a project. Number six is to plan for dissemination and donor reporting. So what this means is that you have to think about what your project is trying to accomplish and how you're going to spread that to the wider audience, uh, especially with research projects. Um, you want to have a way to make sure that your research gets published or gets reviewed, gets um, accepted and gets published. Or if you're publishing um, some piece of knowledge sharing, you wanna make sure that you have a plan towards the end in which you can wrap up your project findings and impact in a succinct, a succinct way such that you can disseminate it in digestible formats. And lastly, you want to collaborate with project leaders in structuring and delivering the final message to stakeholders. So once you have uh, finished the project, how are you going to review your progress, review your impact, and realistically review everyone's contribution and goals to the project leaders and to communicate that impact to project leaders? So let's talk about monitoring in more specifically. So monitoring requires a continuous assessment of the project, which includes continuous feedback and continuous open communication. Um, while I mentioned that a bulk of monitoring activities does happen at the beginning of the projects, that doesn't mean that monitoring stops after you, you know, collect your data, collect your information, collect your sources and stuff like that. Because, because um, an ongoing monitoring process throughout the project can help you keep track of, ex of existing advantages and disadvantages of the resource, resources, resources, excuse me, you have gathered throughout the project, right? In addition, there might be many changes that happen to the project, such as people changing roles or um, people leaving um, or resources being deprecated. Many things like that can affect how the project goes and how the ultimate impact will become. So you planning for monitor generally, follow the, generally follows the um, following areas. It's not limited, but it depends on the project. Uh, the first one is physical and financial. So throughout the project, you need to monitor um, how the project is to achieving its goal and, and how successful it is based on any established timelines and key performance indicators. So this is the part where you might refer back to your milestones to see if you're able to achieve a certain uh, milestone or if you're on track to do it. And if you have defined any metrics within the, the, the project, such as by the second week, 
we're going to spend 10% of the budget, right? And it's okay to spend below that. So if you're monitoring your project, you find out that you spend 8% of the budget, good, that's an extra 2% for you. But if you find out that you've spent like 13% of your budget, that means you are um, not on track or at least on paper, you're not on track, um, for example. So that's a good way to keep making sure that you get to keep track of your resources. The second one is process. So process monitoring accounts for factors that might hinder and expedite progress of activities or success, or success of output production. So this is more logistically speaking, as you monitor through the project. Um, is there too long of an approval process, for example? Like, do you have to, once you finish a draft of a report, do you have to deliver it to someone, to one person, to two people, to three people? Do you have to wait for the person to deliver it to, to deliver it to the next person, et cetera? Um, that is process monitoring. And the third one, impact. Imagine the initial responses and reactions to project activities and their short-term effects. So right here is you're taking smaller chunks of the projects and you're monitoring whether you're actually progressing towards your milestones. You can produce a lot of you know, reports, but they don't all specifically pertain to the ultimate goal. So you're trying to figure out what is um, superficial, what is um, something that's extra that you don't need versus deliverables or um, key progress points that are actually meaningful towards the final uh, point of the project. So for evaluation, evaluation can perform either continuously or periodically. Um, to assess which option is better enough for the project, it is essential to recognize conditions such as what kind of project management style is utilized, um, agile or waterfall. Um, and if you're not familiar with these two terms, agile refers to fast um, and quick iterations of um, questions and answers. So for example, you're trying to build something, um, people might just urge you to build a minimal viable product of something. And once that is done, feedback's proven, and then the person who builds it incorporates the feedback and keep reiterating again and again. Waterfall is similar to a traditional project management style in which you have certain tasks that you need to list out and we need to move task by task. <clears throat> What, what expectations the state project stakeholders have in progress communication? Ultimately, you want to take in what the stakeholders have in, um, in the project, and they expect certain results or, or um, certain impact on the project. So, and you need to make sure that you can communicate these um, to stakeholders. You need to also make sure that the budget is set and what project team needs continuous assessment of whether the project is viable. This is especially useful if you have a very small budget, but for a pretty big scope of a project. And lastly, you have to think about whether human resource is limited um, because the allocation of labor needs to be continuously assessed appropriately in case there's any um, human resource changes or, because, or in case the scope of the project calls for such change. Again, um, evaluation is mentioned that it can be performed either continuously or periodically because you can perform evaluation in conjunction with monitoring and you know throughout a continuous uh, monitoring uh, activity throughout the project you can continuously evaluate okay so what are the results I got from monitoring what are the continuous data points I receive from my monitoring activities that can that can evaluate you can also do it periodically right so for every milestone that you reach you can look back in that period and really answer to answer these questions. Um, and same thing you can do, you know, in the halfway point of the project, um, in the quarter of the way, third of the way, etc. I do recommend though, for evaluation that you perform it at least twice in the entire duration of the project. Um, projects or teams that tend to perform evaluation once at the very end of the project, often um, are less prepared 
uh, to like questioning or when something doesn't meet the expectation of the stakeholders, you're less prepared to answer them. So on a high level, evaluation is performed to serve the following general functions. One is interim evaluation. What that means is that one evaluation is performed usually at the midpoint of the project timeline to assess progress. You can also perform a terminal evaluation, which is one evaluation is performed at the end of the project phase in which progress is analyzed against predetermined criteria and goals to assess whether to stop or continue the project under a new phase. And the third one is ex post evaluation. This evaluation is performed after a certain period of time has passed since the completion of the project to measure the impact. Like I said, I do recommend that during the project, you have at least two, uh, two evaluation activities. So one of them is definitely going to be interim evaluation. The second one can be terminal evaluation, but depending on how many previous evaluations you've, you've done, terminal evaluation might just be the last chunk of evaluation, evaluation that we do. And in regards to number three, ex post evaluation, this one is very crucial in order to see the impact of the project you've made. However, not all projects have the budget for this or not all um, stakeholders will support this. So this is more up to the jurisdiction of the product project stakeholders. Alrighty, let's talk a little deeply about monitoring and what some of the ways that you can be monitoring successful. So the impact monitoring is to achieve the following critical signals in order to assess the health of the project. You want to assess the stakeholders' understanding of the project and its progress. You want to minimize risk of project failure. You want to promote systemic and professional management of the project, as well as all the people involved. And you want to assess progress during and in implementation. You need to real recognize that the role played by various stakeholders in monitoring are equally important. And they include financiers, so the people who handle the budgets, the implementing agencies, the implementers, the project team, any interested groups, um, any groups that they think that may impact it um, are all important. And it should be further recognized that to be an effective management tool, monitoring should be regular, but also should take into account the risks inherent in the project and its implementation. So a project can be divided into smaller goals um, to simplify monitoring and more closely control changes and potential outliers. And this is why I encourage uh, making milestones, defining milestones so, so often, right? So you have your project plan, you have your metrics, your measurements and metrics, and you have a, a, a progress reporting process as well as any mitigation um, process, right? So the project plan and the measurement of the impact of the project need to be identified and they need to be evaluated um, in terms of how the expectations are between you and the project stakeholders, as well as the predefined goals versus what you have so far achieved um, based on your plan, right? So let's say if you, so let's go back to the conversation about your milestone one, you achieve, you're supposed to achieve A, but you achieved B, right? All right, so they're a little bit different, but what is the difference here? And what are some existing elements of B that we can leverage in order to fully leverage, in order to uh, further enhance um, goal A of uh, the project. This is a video on project monitoring. Uh, I'm going to play it for you. And it basically takes a look from professional in how uh, project management is being uh, monitored on a daily basis. <laughs> Today, we're talking about how to monitor daily progress as a project manager. I we'll find it interesting that sometimes people can almost get offended or become defensive if you ask, where are you on the project? In truth, in life, we're always monitoring everything. We monitor our weight. We monitor our diet. We monitor our finances. Nowadays, people can 
monitor their children. Well, so let's look at why it's so important to monitor on your projects. Well, first of all, when we talk about progress, we're talking about forward movement towards a destination. And on a project, we have a, a start date and an end date. So we want to know when we started and when we stopped. So there are always people asking on the team, you know, are we progressing? Are we there yet? And sometimes people like to have an indication, yes, we are advancing. So that's good news. So when we talk about progress, we're looking at different time intervals. Sometimes we look at what did we do yesterday? So we're looking at the past. Sometimes we want to know what are we doing today, like right now? And then sometimes we're concerned about tomorrow. We want to know about future projections. And when we look at this, all of this is some form of data. It could be historical, it could be real time, or it could again be projections. So now let's look at, again, when we're looking at progress, we're looking at where are we now and where should we be? So if we look at where are we now, we're looking at the actual progress versus the expected progress, our goals, and many times our contractual uh, expectations. So when we look at the difference between these two, we're talking about some form of variance. And here are the things that we want to monitor on a project. So we want to look at time. Where are we in relation to the schedule? Are we ahead of schedule? Are we behind schedule? We also want to look at the cost, specifically our budget. Are we meeting our budget? Are we exceeding our budget? We want to know about the money. So we also want to look at scope because scope begins to be the deliverables we're producing, the products, or maybe the services. And then we also want to look at people. Do we have enough people? Do we have too many people? How do we need to compensate? So let's look at how we monitor and specifically we want to look at daily. So first of all, you set your intervals of when you want to monitor. For instance, if you're monitoring daily, you may want to look at specific reports or projections in the morning, maybe at noon or even at night. And ideally on a project, you're looking at things real time. So then you want to collect your data. So when we talk about collecting data, we want to look at what methods are we collecting that data. So today, the great thing is we have all kinds of project management software or tools we can look at, which makes it super simple. Then we can also look at different visuals. Today, we have all kinds of interactive methods like interactive maps, maybe interactive monitors or trackers or scales. We can also survey people on the team. We can also conduct polls and we can also pull different reports. And once we collect our data, then now what do we do with it? We can use that data to evaluate, again, where we are. And based upon the variance of where we are, we can look to adjust. Again, looking at, are we ahead of schedule? Are we behind schedule? And then knowing how to adjust to get back on track. And if, depending upon where we are, we might need to renegotiate something on the project. And if so, we can also re-baseline. So with that, if you need a tool that can help you with your daily progress, then sign up for our software now at projectmanager.com. Cool. Um, I hope you enjoyed that video. I think what she said, very lastly, on setting your intervals is very important because monitoring requires a lot of organization as well as setting up understanding of a cadence. We'll talk about cadence in a little bit, but that's a great uh, introduction to what it is like um, during a typical uh, project monitoring daily process. And the next slide. Okay, cool. So what are some of the tools that you can leverage mo for monitoring? So effective monitoring leverages both communicative and physical messages to convey findings to project leads. Earlier in the class, I mentioned that documentation is very important. So by physical, I want you to think written. It is much easier for stakeholders to understand your point as well as having your point delivered when you have them written down. And especially monitoring because there's so many moving parts 
right, every day on a project. So you can use communication. Communication or monitoring findings need to be timely. So time should not be dedicated solely or prolonged for data gathering and should also be delegated for analysis and interpretation. Um, you want to, you might adopt verbal communication, which is best for short-term findings and quick messages. They may be accompanied with a written document of key points. So when you have a quick finding or you wanted to convey something that's a little bit time, uh, timely, you want to communicate it verbally. And with that, I do recommend um, preparing some sort of a high level um, document of key points so that some so that folks can refer to it once you leave the meeting. In addition, longer term meetings should have a cadence with the steering committee and agendas prepared for all meetings. So in case you didn't know, a steering committee is the committee that decides on the priorities or order of project tasks and manages the general course of project operations. So as you, the project manager, you need to make sure that you deliver your results and progress to people who actually decide on what to do with the project. And by preparing agendas for those meetings, you're able to um, reduce questions as well as make sure that everyone can follow along to your points. Another tool that you can use, like I mentioned, is physical reporting. So you can have a detailed report or some sort of detailed documentation for procedures, findings, and data. But for the summary or for the findings, you need to be concise. And you might have experience writing similar reports before, but an executive summary at the very, in the very beginning of the report is important to summarize your points for stakeholders who might not have as much time as you to read through the entire report. And that's just the reality. <laughs> So for reporting, the purpose of project monitoring report is to provide information to assist stakeholders in comparing performance against plans so that current and potential problems can be identified and analyzed. So you want to document the completion of project activities and track that of your timeline. You want to identify significant deviations from project plans. You want to reveal any problems to stakeholders for your documentation so they have it in writing. You want to assist in any corrective action and corrective decision making, as well as implementation of those corrective actions, because you are the one who's knowledgeable on what's going on and what's wrong with the project. You want to identify shortcomings of existing management and monitoring systems. So you can be the voice in, you know, provide feedback on how the process is like and how you as a project manager can improve the, pro the, the, the project. And lastly, you want to provide reference material for planning of subsequent projects and future evaluators. Remember at the beginning of the class where I mentioned that um, there's a portion of monitoring evaluation in which your current resources and knowledge can be shared with another team. This is where it comes in. By using documentation, you're able to uh, write down your knowledge as well as any of the methods that you've utilize in order to support other teams as well as future teams that will build from your project. And now let's talk about evaluation. So evaluation is performed to achieve the following critical signals for the health of the project. It assists to determine the degree of achievement of the objectives in terms of really how is the milestone coming along? How is the quality is like? Is it up to par of expectations? It determines and identifies the problems associated with project planning and implementation. So throughout your project, as you perform evaluation, you're able to look back and, and use data-driven um, resources to see whether your um, existing processes are truly effective or not, and whether your monitoring is adequate. Evaluation also generates data that allows for cumulative learning, which contributes to better design programs, improved management, and a better assessment of their impact. The key words in the scenarios are lessons learned because it is okay to make mistakes, but with, the, with evaluation, you're able to look more closely at what the mistakes are, what are their root causes, as well as ways that you can prevent that further happening. This is excellent knowledge, not just for you, but also for future project teams as well. And lastly, evaluation assists in the reformulation of objectives, 
policies and strategies and projects. Sometimes it is realistic to revamp your project and that is done as a result of um, different changing of different expectations, different goals being shifted or just any emergence that come up that you may or may not be able to control. So evaluation prepares you for that and it prepares you with data points in terms of where you can most leverage during this formulation process. So project evaluation fit in the grand scale of project management um, in from the very beginning, in the middle, for the end. So it is important in all stages and um, depending where you perform these activities, um, it is never a wrong time to perform. So as you can see from this flow, there is a part where you can analyze the results of uh, after you obtain, um, your, after you execute your plan and you obtain your results and you analyze your results. You can then identify the variances in which how the project's goals are being met and what are some of the ways that this is not meeting expectations. You reiterate this again, you analyze the results and then you root cause it and then you take corrective action, you implement it, et cetera. So this becomes lessons learned in the overall cycle of um, improving a project. It is important to note that evaluation and monitoring work together with each other and often the two occur simultaneously. Um, it should be also be noted that in some cases, evaluation has been used to resolve non-project issues affecting different donors. For instance, two organizations involved in separate but similar projects may undertake an evaluation of the entire project to assess the extent to which they can cooperate. Consequently, evaluation can be seen as a process that determines the viability of projects, as well as facilitates decisions on further resource and commitment. And this is where these two work together. While you're gathering data points and while you're reviewing your data points on monitoring, you're able to drive data and drive the analysis with evaluation to determine where your team fits in and where the potentially the other team fits in. And what are some of the ways that you can specialize and make the, pro make the entire project more successful and more efficient? In this uh, diagram below, there are three types of project evaluation. The first one is pre-project evaluation. So before you even start a project, you have to evaluate the viability of that project. And this is where you have to work very closely with the stakeholders on determining expectations and the goals. Second one is ongoing evaluation. Ongoing evaluation is um, crucial to monitor and evaluate in the project, and it can be performed simultaneously with monitoring. This is used to basically keep track of your progress, making sure that expectations are met. And then lastly, there's the post-project evaluation. So when the project is finished, um, you may take some time to evaluate what worked and what didn't, and you want to learn from your mistakes. And this is where you document your lessons. This is where you document your root causes and your solutions to deliver to the next team or for your future projects. So here are two general tools for your evaluation. Um, unfortunately, I won't go too deep into uh, technically how to use these two tools, but hopefully you have at least some exposure to using them. The first one, Excel. Excel is very useful in analyzing data points, especially with pivot tables and graphs. Um, very easily, um, you can just enter your data into the cells and Excel as a tool can recognize data. Tableau is a little bit more complicated, but it looks much better. Tableau is an interactive um, platform which you can um, create customized visualizations with data sources that you feed into the tool. You have to note that data that both Tableau and Excel are, are, are enterprise tools. Um, and hopefully um, wherever you work or wherever you research, I will to provide these two tools. Um, and if I were to say it for myself, I love Tableau and it's my number one tool for visualizing data. Um, however, I use Excel a lot to organize data. So what could possibly go wrong? So the limits of monitoring, while 
It provides ample opportunities for growth and fosters a sense of responsibility within the project team. And overloaded or overly personal monitoring may also impede progress. This goes to micromanaging. If you are monitoring everyone in every step of the project very closely, that might cause inefficiencies, such as um, unpracticed monitors may over, overly rely on a predetermined set of data for information and monitoring. Again, projects are dynamic and they're meant to be dynamic. If you follow the rules uh, word by word, you might, not be, you might not be able to be become flexible enough to face any changes or any roadblocks that might come up. The attitude of individuals conducting monitoring may cause them to hide information and become too subjective. So if you uh, pick someone who is bad at monitoring or pick someone who clearly has their own agenda, their results and their messages might be biased and that might actually derail your project. Monitoring might emphasize problems rather than opportunities. So as a monitor, you might focus on what are the gaps that this project is facing and you might not focus on why don't we try this or well, this new idea that I have based on what I've seen here or there's an opportunity for us to expand into the scope. Um, that is always a good thing to keep in mind um, because this activity does involve a lot of catching errors and catching gaps and by focusing, or sorry, by dedicating some of your focus to identifying opportunities, you will not only help others, but also create a positive environment. And lastly, monitoring reports may not be shared with those who provided the data. So you might uh, manipulate data and you might get findings out of the data of the result of monitoring. However, you might not able to always share the data of the source of the data for whatever reason. And that's just an unfortunate circumstance in which people are not able to freely um, share their data. However, this is often not the case um, by working with organizations who are open to collaboration as well as at the end of a project, um, findings are usually being able to share unless it's classified. Limits of evaluation. So likewise, Evaluation also faces the problem of objectivity. So it is generally accepted that external, external evaluators, such as third-party consultants, um, need to undertake evaluation in order to provide an objective finding. So what does that mean? So you can, so if you're working on a project and you can definitely um, onboard someone within your team to act as an evaluator. However, you want to make sure that you prevent as much bias as you can. So you hire a third party consultant. A third party evaluator is able to provide a objective, more objective perspective on your project and the progress of your project because they don't have anything or hopefully not tied to the project. So think of your classical consulting companies such as McKinsey, um, Boston Consulting Group, PwC, Deloitte, they often go to organizations and they assess and they audit their companies. This is essentially what is going on. And you must see my guest, factors such as budget, community resources, and project team knowledge may hinder external evaluators unproductively and or to provide little value. So if you don't have enough money, you cannot hire high quality external evaluators or hiring them at all. If you have little community resources, there's no point hiring um, third party evaluators because the scope is so small that they are not able to provide much value. And lastly, if your own team is not knowledge knowledgeable enough in this project, they're not able to provide context and important hints to external evaluators for them to look at crucial things. And in order to overcome this potential problem, Project leads should plan for a conducive environment that can facilitate knowledge transfer between external evaluators and the project team. So whether you get a third party or someone that doesn't have ties to the project to evaluate, there should be an environment which information can be freely exchanged between the two parties. I've personally worked with clients in which they withdraw information from us 
And that made our work longer, more difficult as well. It just expanded the host scope unnecessarily. So let's talk a little bit more about project risk management and some good practices. So for risk management, it is recommended to define the scope before the project kickoff to forecast potential risks and delays. So this is akin to your uh, pretty decent project planning situation in which you want to define your goals and you want to define what potential can come up that I need to prepare for. You need to create a cont contingency plans before the project, for the project, and throughout the project. So taking into account the environment of the project it takes place in, where's the risk that might come up? And this is where monitoring comes in especially useful. Three is to assess risk consistently for each project activity. Don't assess you know, risks at the end of the project. When you evaluate the project, uh, looking backwards, you found out that there's 10 things wrong with the project, that'd be too late to fix them, right? So um, evaluation is very important throughout the projects in order to make sure that risks are caught quickly and resolved quickly. And lastly, you want to have more control in place that can quickly address the mitigated risks. By controls, I mean factors such as there's an approval process, there's a review process, there is some sort of system security that doesn't let other people access the sensitive information. Here is another video on project risk management, and hopefully you enjoy. Here is play. In this video, I want to give you an overview of risk management and how to manage project risk. Risk management is a core part of all project management. And the reason is simple. Projects are novel and uncertain endeavors. And that novelty, that uncertainty, means that things can happen that you're not expecting. Projects are inherently risky. And so we need to manage that risk to stay in control of our projects. And the basic risk management process has four steps. The first step is to identify the risks. And the best way is always to get a group of people together and just list out everything you can think of that could possibly go wrong. Of course, some of the things you think of are incredibly unlikely, but we'll come to that later. Another good way to identify risks is to look at the different aspects of the project and ask what can go wrong on a category by category basis, however you choose to break up your project. And so risk management can start in earnest once you've started to think about the scope of your project and you can go to a greater level of depth once you've got a work breakdown structure. Another great approach is as you move through your career from one project to another, keep a record of all the risks that are identified in each project. That way you'll have a master list of risks which you can draw down on for identifying potential risks for each new project. Once you've identified your risks, the next step is to understand them, to analyze those risks. Now, the definition of a risk is uncertainty that can affect outcome. Therefore, the two principal components of a risk are the likelihood with which it might happen and the impact it will have if it does. The uncertainty is measured by likelihood and the effect on the project is measured by the impact. There are other things we can bring into our analysis if we're taking on risk management at an advanced level, like proximity. However, for most of us, for most projects, Estimating the likelihood and the impact of our risks is the key to good risk analysis. Now, when you're thinking about likelihood for your risks, my key piece of advice is keep it simple. Because human beings are rubbish at estimating the likelihood of uncertain events. And the consequence of that is that if you try to be too precise, too specific, about the likelihood of your estimates, then they're 
likely to be rubbish. A simple scale of low, medium and high, or if you want a little bit more precision, very low, low, medium, high and very high is all you need as a scale for the likelihood of your risks. For the impact, you can use a more sophisticated scale if you choose. The first thing to think about is what do you really care about? Do you care about the impact of risks on your budget? Because if that's the case, then you may have a scale of hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and even millions of dollars. Or you may care about the schedule effect of a risk. What will it do to the delivery date? In which case your impact scale might be days, weeks, months, quarters, or years. You might be interested in the reputational effects. If something goes wrong, how will it affect our reputation? Will we see a small paragraph in a trade journal or a local paper? Or will we see a full article? Or will that article make its way through to the national press? Or will it get onto the front page of the national press? Or will it dominate the 10 o'clock news for day after day? But for most of us, a simple scale is to first think about the smallest level of impact being one that requires some form of corrective action. A greater impact may need you to think about a new plan for how you're going to deliver that part of the project. Or you may need a whole new strategy for how you're going to deliver the whole project. Or it may be worse than that. And no amount of replanning and new strategies will allow you to achieve all of your objectives. One or more of your objectives will be compromised if this risk occurs. And of course, the greatest level of risk that you should be managing without highly specialized experience is the risk that the project will fail. The goal of your project is compromised. Yes, of course, there are higher impacts than that. People being hurt or the reputation of your organization being permanently tarnished. But of course, if those are real risks, you need to bring in real experts to help you manage them. Now, once you've analyzed your risks, you can then triage them by looking at where they appear on a simple graph of likelihood versus impact. And of course, the further up towards the top right hand corner that they appear, then the more serious that risk is and the more strategies you will need to manage your risk. So step three of our risk management process is to put together a plan for how you will handle that risk. And we build our plans from a number of component strategies. And the six core strategies that I always build my plans from are firstly, to see if you can do anything to remove the risk entirely. This is the gold standard, but on many projects, it, for many risks, it is not possible to remove the risk entirely, but if you can, you should do so. The second strategy is to reduce the likelihood, to make it less likely that that risk will materialize. Strategy number three is to reduce the impact of the risk. If it happens, then what can we do to make it less severe, less serious? Fourthly, we could transfer some or all of that risk to a third party. The obvious example is insurance. But remember, every time you enter into a contract for professional services of one form or another, you are transferring some of that risk to the other party and using the contract to enforce that transfer. The fifth approach is to accept that the risk may happen and to build a contingency plan so that you can handle that risk should it materialize. A plan B. This is about having the resources and the preparedness to deal with the outcome should the risk occur. And of course, the sixth strategy is to accept the risk. If the level of threat is small enough and you consider that none of the other strategies offers a cost effective solution for reducing the risk, 
then it's totally appropriate to accept the risk and accept that if it does occur, you'll need to do something about it. But hopefully it will not be a very serious risk because otherwise you will have implemented one or more strategies. And clearly for the highest likelihood and impact risks to the top right, you'll need a whole basket of strategies to handle them. And finally, the fourth stage of risk management is, of course, to put your plans into action. And hopefully you will have documented your risks and your plans on a risk register, which is, if anything, the one single most important project management document that you will have. That risk register becomes part of your audit trail and therefore a document of governance. But it's also a management tool that allows you to track what you are doing and to keep an eye on your risks. And of course, every time you take an action, you can then record that action on your risk register and monitor the impact it has on your risks. If the action doesn't satisfactorily reduce the risk, then analyze why not come up with an additional plan and take further action. And that's the cycle of success. Understand the situation, put together a plan, take action and review where you are and understand the outcome. In this video, I want to... I'm going to stop right here and continue. But he did raise very good points on why it is important to perform um, these actions as well as some of the best ways that you can prepare for a project management plan. So the, the best practices are to document your processes. This includes any process steps, decisions coming out of meetings, resources, and individual working on the project activities, as well as keeping track of ownership and their progress. You want to segregate duties and be mindful of sensitive accesses. Install multiple levels of approvals, create a comprehensive review and approval documentation process, and conduct frequent reviews of sensitive access of data information. Do people who need access to certain data need access to another set of data? Probably not, probably yes. That's where you come in and determine that. In addition, do you want two people to work on the same thing and they clash? No. So segregate your duties and make sure that people are clear of their responsibilities. Three, establish a meeting cadence early. Get it on the calendar early, making sure that everyone knows in order to make sure that people are aware of upcoming meetings as well as things to prepare for that meeting. Utilize frameworks. I've linked a couple frameworks in here to help you uh, draw your planning as well as draw your monitor and, and evaluation activities. Hopefully you can use them to the best of your ability, but essentially prioritization matrices are matrices that outline different levels of priorities with different tasks. Imagine like a, imagine a spreadsheet, but with a list of tasks with a list of prioritization. And lastly, establish relationships early and be open in communication. You want to create a positive and friendly environment for everyone. And that's how you want to uh, your project team to operate. And that's how you're going to achieve results. All right, this is the end of the class. I hope that uh, you join this content. And if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to uh, email me or reach out directly. I have my email here, uh, jimzjshu at gmail.com as well as my LinkedIn profile and learning more about what we do as statistics, I can never say that word, statistics without borders. Thank you so much.